words of joy and hope. Eighth Sunday in Ordinary Time, Year C, Gospel according to St. Luke, Chapter 6, Verses 39 to 45. Commentary of Father Fernando Armelini. A good Sunday to all. This is the third Sunday in which the liturgy makes us listen to the inaugural discourse of Jesus, discourse that began with a eulogy that Jesus addressed to his disciples who had followed him and said to them, You are blessed because you have become poor. You have renounced to keep your goods for yourselves and have given them to your brothers who are in need. You have secured life and you are blessed. Then he went further and showed where this love, this willingness to serve the brother should go. And he said, Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. If someone steals your cloak and one day you see that he is cold and is in need, take off your coat and give it to him. This is the pinnacle of love, beyond which it is not possible to go. Whoever comes to love in this way is a whole person. And Jesus has also said what the reward will be for those who allow themselves to be involved in this love and says, the Most High will recognize them as his children. They will resemble him for the Father in heaven loves unconditionally and is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. When you come to love the enemy, you become like the Father in heaven. Here is the new face of God, which is no longer that of the Pharisees, the lawgiver who stood scrutinizing his subjects and then took note of good deeds and transgressions and then rewarded or punished justly. Enough with this God. The God already spoken of in the scripture is the merciful God. In Hebrew, Rahu derived from Rehen, which is the mother's womb. This is the visceral love and it would be better to say the uterine love like that of a mother. It is the supreme love. It is the image that was taken from the scriptures by God to describe it. It's a poor image of course because God's love goes infinitely beyond mother's love. Here then is Jesus' invitation which is the apex of this discourse. Become merciful yourselves as your heavenly Father is merciful. To be merciful means to let oneself be involved in this unconditional love. We are aware and even proud to be possessors of this sublime life proposal that at this point Jesus wants to warn us of a danger, which is the one of the Pharisees have fallen into. Jesus has seen this danger and does not want it to reappear among his disciples. Paul very well describes this danger in the second chapter of the letter to the Romans, speaking to the Pharisees, which he knows very well because he was one of them, addressing his co-religionists who are proud because they know the Torah. He says to them, You call yourself a Jew, that is, you are a son of Abraham, heir of the promises, and you rest secure because you know the law, the Torah, and you the will of God, and you know how to discern between this good and what is evil, what is right and what is wrong. And that's why you are convinced that you are now the guide of the blind. You feel as light of those who are still groping in the dark. You present yourself as an educator of the ignorant as a teacher of those you consider poor illiterates. But how is it you who teach others and not yourself? That is, you Jew, Pharisee, you think of, you know everything, 
that you are in complete harmony with the Torah and you teach others and you forget that the Torah is still teaching you before you teach others and you cannot be a teacher and guide. Paul goes on to say, you preach that one should not steal and then you steal. You preach what is learned from the Torah that one should not commit adultery, but then go on committing adultery. You detest idols and then rob temples. You boast that you know the law and then offend God by transgressing the law. The consequence, Paul says, is that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Jesus fears that among the, his disciples, this pharisaical confidence that a feeling at ease with God may appear and therefore of being teachers and guides. And Jesus explains this danger in a parable. Let us listen. Jesus told them a parable. Can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? No disciple is superior to the teacher. But when fully trained, every disciple will be like his teacher. The saying that a blind person cannot lead a blind person is of elementary logic. The problem arises when the blind is convinced that he can see and begins to guide others. Jesus applied this saying to directly to the scribes and Pharisees, as the evangelist Matthew tells us in chapter 15. There was a lively discussion because the scribes said to Jesus, How dare you and your disciples not to do the ritual purifications? Jesus replied, You substitute adherence to God and His word for adherence to traditions you have invented. When they returned home, the disciples said to Jesus, Be more careful when you speak because you scandalize them. Jesus replies to his disciples, Leave them alone. They are blind and guides of the blind. They are blind because they had an image of God that they had invented themselves. A God who was exactly like them, a judge, an executioner, and they did not want their eyes opened. They had before them the perfect image of the God of Abraham, of the God of Isaac, of the God of Jacob, but they did not want to let their eyes be opened and they set themselves up as guides of the people and they all ended up in a pit. The same very severe judgment is found on the lips of Jesus after the healing of the man born blind in chapter 9 of the Gospel according to John. Jesus says, I have come into this world that those who do not see recognize that they are blind and open their eyes. But those who are convinced that they see may remain blind. The Pharisees who were present understood that he meant them and said to him, are we blind too? Jesus answers them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. You should open your eyes. But instead, you say that you see, and then your blindness remains because you are convinced that you see. The same thing can happen to the disciples. And this is what Jesus wants to make very clear because the scribes and the Pharisees have already died and are in the arms of the merciful Father, but Jesus does not want the same thing to happen to his community. In the early church, the disciples were called among themselves the enlightened ones. In baptism, their eyes were opened. The gospel, Christ, enlightened them. And they were called Hoifotistendes and baptistery. The baptismal font was called 
Fortisterion, the place where they were enlightened. After baptism, the Christian did not worship a pagan image of God anymore, an idol invented by people, but worshipped the true God, which they had seen in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Also today, through the gospel, we continue to see Jesus of Nazareth. Before their eyes were opened, they were withdrawn into the realities of this world, the material realities for them. Only the goods of this world, the pleasures counted. Now, however, they see the things of this world in the right way. They know how to give the right value to the realities of this world. In the letter to the Ephesians, in chapter 5, it says, Once you were in darkness, now you are light. Now you have been enlightened, behave as children of light. Therefore, the consequence among you is that fornication be not even mentioned, or all kinds of impurity, of covetousness, vulgarity, insults, trivialities. They must not even be heard on the lips of the baptized because they are now light and the light is goodness, righteousness and truth. Christians, however, the disciples must always bear in mind that although they have been enlightened, they can never become guides. The only guide is Christ and his gospel. And it is this guide that the disciples must have always present. To this guide, to this gospel, all must always refer. Even to the best of the disciples, their sight can easily become clouded and therefore they may revert to re reasoning according to standards of this world, to justify what they com condemned before, to boast of what they were ashamed of before. Well, says the Book of Wisdom, the reasoning of mortals is frail. Our reflections are uncertain because a corruptible body weighs upon the soul. Within us, there is always the impulse of what Paul calls the flesh contrary to the spirit's impulses. Therefore, not even the one who has been enlightened can lead others because he is weak and frail. And the only guide is always Christ and his word. The second danger that the disciples runs is that of feeling that he is a teacher. The disciple is neither a guide nor a teacher. In fact, Jesus forbade all these titles. You cannot call someone father, teacher or guide because if you give him these titles, then you start believing in them and you become like the Pharisees and the scribes. The teacher is one. The guide is Christ. And he must go ahead and we must follow in his footsteps. Among brothers and sisters, we encourage one another. But all of us contemplating Christ, not that one of us begins to be a guide. The teacher is also one, the spirit. Jesus told us this at the Last Supper. In the 15th and 16th chapters of John's Gospel, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth and will teach you everything and will remind you of what I have told you and will bear witness of me. What Jesus meant is that there is a teacher within us. The teacher is the spirit that has been given to us. At all times, he is advising us on the choices we have to make. Choices that confirm with our identity as sons and daughters of God. Listening to his voice is a delightful experience that each one of us can and should do. For example, I recently mentioned what Jesus said in this inaugural address of his public life. He said that we must love our enemies, that we must do good to those who harm us, 
to give our tunic even to the one who stole our cloak? This is against the logic of this world, but if we reflect for a moment, we hear a voice within our hearts that says, He is right, do what he tells you, and you will be a real person. When we hear this voice, it is the voice of the Spirit, it is the voice of the Master, of the one and only Master. We cannot be teachers or guides because we are blind, frail, and easily clouded our sight. The letter to the Ephesians says in chapter 4, We have a great treasure which is the gospel. This treasure that we have discovered, we have had this good fortune to have it in our hands, but this treasure we keep it in earthen vessels. We are made of fragile clay, impure clay. Let us always keep this in mind so that none of us can set ourselves up as guides and teachers. How to behave when there are brothers and sisters with fragility and misery even in the Christian community? Let us listen to what Jesus tells us. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eyes, but do not perceive the wooden beam in your own? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me remove the splinter in your eye, when you do not even notice the wooden beam in your own eyes? You hypocrite! Remove the wooden beam from your eyes first, then you will see clearly to remove the splinter in your brother's eye. Surely, you have noticed in this part of Jesus' discourse the insistence on the term brother. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me remove that splinter in your eye. Remove the wooden beam from your own eye first. And then you will see clearly to remove the splinter in your brother's eye. Jesus uses this term four times. We know that brother was the most common title with which the early Christians identified themselves. Jesus therefore does not address the outsiders, the pagans. He addresses the members of the Christian communities. And in this watermark, we also have the presentation of the problems of the communities of Luke's time, problems that are not different from ours, and that the evangelist illuminates with the words of the Master, which therefore are also addressed to us today. First of all, why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye? Our eyes instinctively rest on what is not good, on a defect because it bothers us. There shouldn't be certain behaviors within the Christian community. What does Jesus say? Why do you notice? He doesn't say, because you humbly try to help your brother see well. No, he says, you have noticed. Before you become interested for your brother's problems, first you must check if you see well. First, remove the beam in your eye. It is easy to notice this defect in the scribes and Pharisees. If we go to chapter 23 of the Gospel of Matthew, we are told that these people paid the tithe of mind and cumin, but then they neglected righteousness and mercy. Here is the beam that was before their eyes. And then they were mindful of the lint, that is, the mind and cumin. Mark says they are blind guides who filter the nut and swallow the camel. Here is the beam and the lint again. It is more delicate to make some application to our day, but let us try to think about it. How was it possible in the Crusades that those who are called to give their lives even for the enemy using the sword and let us also think about the recent world wars of our, the last century. Were not Christians fighting and killing each other 
while debating if it was a mortal sin to prepare soup with a bucket of meat, the beam and the lint, or those who campaigned against ballroom dancing in the United States and did not question, did not wonder about the slavery present in the country. He who looks at the straw, the defect, the error committed by our brother, says Jesus, is a hypocrite. Jesus does not say that we should not help our brother cleanse his eye, but he who looks at the speck is a hypocrite. Hypocrites in Greek means actor, comedian. Then we wonder what kind of character these hypocrites represent. That is, those who behave in this way, those who are on the lookout for faults, what character do they represent? They represent God. The God they have in mind behaves exactly like them and they act well. The God that the Pharisees preached and in which these scribes still believe is the God who takes note of all the errors, is attentive to all the errors that what people do. He loses sight of no sin. He takes note of everything. These comedians behave exactly like the God they believe in. And they represent very well this character they put on stage. But it is a horrible character. And God doesn't want to be represented in this way because it is a blasphemous mask they put on his face. And here we have the problem. How to distinguish in the Christian community those who see rightly and therefore can help me to clear my eyes, although they are not teachers and guides from whom I can listen to their suggestions? How do I know who I can trust and the right and wrong advice? With the last two images of today's gospel, Jesus offers the criteria to discern between who follows the Master and listens to the voice of the Spirit and who instead does not follow the Master and listen, listens instead to the flesh and not to the Spirit. Jesus now offers us the criteria for discernment. Let us listen. A good tree does not bear rotten fruit, nor does a rotten tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes, nor do they gather grapes from brambles. A reasonable person out of the stores of goodness in his heart produces good, but an evil person out of a store of evil produces evil. For from the fullness of the heart the mouth speaks. Not just a beam, but just a speck gives a lot of trouble in the eye. I must find someone. How can I recognize who can help me? Because I might go to the wrong person, someone who has a beam in front of his eyes, and that would only harm me. And how should I be if I realize that a brother, a sister, my fellow traveler has lost sight of the guide who is Christ, has gone off the path, and he needs help. These are the questions. How do I recognize the true disciple who can be trusted? To this question, Jesus answers with two images. The first is that of the tree that be bears fruit. If it's a good tree, it bears good fruit. Observe the fruit, says Jesus. The image of the tree is biblical. Let us remember Psalm 1. A righteous man is like a tree that is planted by the streams of water. It brings forth fruits in its season. Its leaves do not wither, precisely because it sings its roots to the water course. Jesus says that, you can trust those who sink their roots by the living water of the word of God. 
you cannot expect beautiful fruits beautiful messages from those who do not refer to the gospel but to their reasoning according to the criteria of this world or pseudo revelations he also says that the fruits you must see are the figs and the grapes they are the products of the promised land which are the image of the fruits that god expects from his people the sweetness of the fig tree the joy that comes from the grapes because grapes give wine and wine symbolizes joy these are the fruits that you must see if you come close to your brother and his words infuse you with joy and hope make you experience love and the mercy of the father you have found the right person who can help you jesus also tells us to be very careful because perhaps a brother who is lost in life approaches our christian community in search of light of welcome of understanding of love and jesus asks us to be attentive that this person will not find thorns not feel hurt judged and condemned but only find good fruits gentleness love the second image is that of the treasure kept in the heart's treasure chest jesus asks us check what is there in your brother's heart it is easy to know because the words of his mouth reveal it the mouth speaks from the fullness of his heart if one speaks only of money of business of sports of gossip it means that his heart is full of those things the buddhist will speak according to the criteria of buddhism the muslim will reason as a muslim the pagan will reason as a pagan you cannot expect them to speak according to the criteria of the gospel the true christian is recognized not only by his works but also by the way they speak you can tell immediately if their words come from a heart overflowing with the gospel because they judge according to the gospel they give advice referring to the gospel they suggest evangelical courageous challenging heroic choices and above all from their lips come only words of love because their heart is full of mercy like that of his father in heaven i wish you all a good sunday and a good week